Everyone, I would like to introduce you to Mr. Paul Cannon, a World War II POW survivor. He was a navigator. We were given permission from Mr. Cannon to share his story. These words are written and these paintings were made from him while he was a POW in Germany. An incredible story I'm excited to share. In October 1942, at the age of 19, I enlisted in the Air Corps. I had basic training at Randolph Field, San Antonio, Texas. As a cadet, I received gunnery training in Harlingen. At the gunnery school, it was a lot of fun because part of the thing was sitting on, on a flat car that was moving with uh, shotguns, and they would sh shoot up a skeet thing, and you learned how to either lead it or go backwards to compensate for the fact that you were moving forward. And then also, we were taught to use a machine gun, take it apart, blindfolded, put it together blindfolded. And then the fun part was sitting in an AT-6 two-seater open plane, strapped down and standing up with a machine gun shooting at a tow target. And every six bullet was color-coded. So when they finally took the target down on the ground, I mean, it was a long sleeve, they would count the holes that were made by my shooting. And that was an exciting thing. We studied all kinds of things besides navigation. Part of the training was physics, hydraulics, to understand how the turrets would work. Technical training followed at Ellington Field, Houston, and San Marcos Navigation School, Austin. I was then given wings and commissioned as a second lieutenant. I enjoyed the challenge of flight navigation, and especially celestial navigation, using stars and constellations I had long been familiar with. They were like reassuring old friends, helping to guide me home. I was later selected for additional training as a radar navigator at Langley Field, Virginia. There I was made part of a flight crew for air practice, honing our skills before going overseas. One of our training flights was a total disaster. On February 14, 1944, we were to make a night training flight following a large triangular pattern and without radio or celestial assistance relying on only pilotage that is using only visual checkpoints on the ground combined with dead reckoning. We got a briefing on the weather. We were told we would run into a front, but not to uh, be deterred, fly through it because it would be a short stretch. And we went off with that kind of information. Yankee was the pilot, and Yankee was a very competent guy. And we were a very tight crew. We had flown any number of practice missions for navigation purposes. So we ran into the front, but it just would not let go. It was severe, and we were getting iced up. All attempts to see checkpoints on the ground became impossible. A power failure knocked out not only the lighting in my area, but my navigational instruments as well. There was no way at this point that I reliably could say where we were, much less pinpoint our position. I couldn't see out. I couldn't use any kind of navigation. The radios wouldn't work. We were in desperate straits. And I was just about in tears. I was so frustrated and embarrassed, not that I could do anything about it, that I was not able to be helpful and we didn't know where we were. The plane was losing altitude. A Yankee gave us a choice. Anyone want to bail out? We might be over the Gulf of Mexico. None of us wanted to. So we all decided to stick with the plane. But the plane was losing altitude and almost miraculously, Yankee was able to spot two runs of lights. And what they were on a small airstrip and we didn't know where it was. We had no other choice. We all braced ourselves in ditching positions for a belly landing. As taught in earlier training films, Yankee was fantastic. Despite his iced up windshield, he managed to make a circle and land the plane, wheels up. Having no brakes, we continued to skid for an eternity. We took out the length of that, took out a chain link fence across the highway, and wound up like this with a couple broken 
Municipal Palace, no one was hurt. Finally coming to a stop with the nose buried in the ground and the tail up in the air. Unfairly, they had a review of Yankee as if he had any fault. But he was excused because they conceded we had been given false information and he was following the instructions we were given. After several more months of training flights, we were considered ready for combat. The last airstrip that we were on before going overseas was at Westover Field, Massachusetts, near Springfield. We were given sealed envelopes. We were given Eskimo kind of outfits, parkas, boots like this, high fur line, mittens up to here. We were told not to open the thing until we were up at altitude with our Eskimo suits. So I thought, oh my God, we're going to go with the Aleutians and fight against the Japanese and the cold climate. We get up to altitude, we open it, lo and behold, we're going to go to Italy. We rested a day and studied the authorized flight plan. We were to fly from Newfoundland to St. Miguel Azores to Marrakesh, Morocco to Cherinola, Italy. We were to maintain radio silence and not to use radio beacons for navigation. I had to get us to these destinations exclusively by dead reckoning. Well, I was a hero. My ETA landing was about two miles off the ETA of about a minute or two off and I got a lot of cheering from the crew. So I was the hero and I, I felt elated. Cerinola, Italy was an impoverished farm area. This was the base for the 828th Bomb Squadron, 485th Bomb Group, 15th Air Force. I was the radar navigator in the four missions. By the time we arrived in Italy, the American Air Force had decided carpet bombing was the most effective way of wiping out enemy targets. We were supposed to bomb uh, a bridge in Avignon, France. And I looked out after the bombs were dropped. We, we didn't wipe out the bridge, but, bridge, but we wiped out half the town instead. And we were all um, were saddened by it and disappointed in our bombardier. My last mission, September 13th, 1944. My last mission was the crew that was flying on there last mission. Very sad. Like Gallo's humor, they were chatting back and forth. You're not worried, man. They're all trying to not worry. But six of it got killed. And five of us survived. And they were all strangers to me. I never met these guys. That mission on September 13th, which was to bomb a factory on the outskirts of uh, Auschwitz, well, a good part of the factory was destroyed, but also we killed uh, about 200 inmates and a couple guards in Auschwitz. The moment the bombs dropped out, I heard a loud explosion. Debris and broken glass shot through the flight deck. Acrid smoke came through my mask, forcing me to rip it off. At the same time, the intercom went dead. And the intercom was shot. You couldn't hear anything. The pilot and co-pilot wore back parachutes already in place. Everyone else on the plane had bun uh, bundles nearby with a very good harness with spring clips. You take the bundles, click it on. The top turret gunner, uh, Christensen was his name, was trying to get out and he was caught up with this bundle. So I was able to pull his legs enough that he got free. He dropped down. He said, the queen's on fire, one of the engines is on fire, and already we had flames coming out of the bomb bay, and we took fire extinguishers and tried to put it out, it did nothing. Then we, I turned, I see the pilot and co-pilot getting out of their seats. I did what we always saw in movies, and this particular thing, you get right at the Bombay door and just jump out. Well, Chris was in front of me and he froze. I pushed him out. I only clicked on 
in my bundle. And I prepared to, to go out in the power and co power behind me and the plane so it go forward and then lurch back. So the three of us fell forward and then to get thrown not out but in the, the nose wheel compartment. So the three of us were stuck in a nose wheel compartment. I tried pulling myself out. I couldn't. Suddenly, the plane twisted into another position in its death spiral, and I was miraculously sucked out of the bomb bay and falling through space. I had remembered, training films, to wait for a count of 25 seconds, if high enough, before pulling the ripcord in order to slow up and be clear of the plane. I waited and went for the ripcord and no parachute. I don't have the chute. And I knew damn well I clicked on the chute. That's all there was to it. It's not a little wimpy thing. These spring, each spring whip was like this. Fortunately, I did not panic, but looked up and saw to my delight that at the end of the two 12 or 15 feet long web straps was the chute bundle. The straps were part of the harness. I pulled it down, re-clicked it, pulled it, it opened up, and I started swinging like a pendulum. And for the first and only time, became airsick. The cold, greasy eggs and the events that followed made a terrible combination. Being fastidious, I waited until I was on the backswing before I threw up. So as not to soil myself. The ground was now fast approaching. As were motorcycle soldiers, I could see following me as I drifted over the farmland. I still had presence of mind to look at my watch. Okay. I couldn't tell what altitude I was, but I must have flown around 15,000 feet. I also looked at if there was any weight I could slip into the woods, not a chance of no woods. And it took another 12 minutes before I hit the ground. 